started in, in Genesis, and I'm there looking at the covenant in Genesis 15, and it's one of the passages I absolutely love is to, to teach on this covenant language that's established between God and Abram, and, and when God uh, changes their name from Abram and Sarai to Abraham and Sarah, and he in, infuses the of God, and you, it's incredible, but I, I love to teach on it and get lost in it, and God said, don't do it. Because I think we confuse covenants and contracts in the day in which we live. Amen. I wanted to preach out of the book of Revelation, and God said, not yet. I think you ought to read it. And so I, I've, I've taken time to try to hear what it is I'm supposed to tell you. And I can boil it down to this, and if you feel like saying, okay, that was good enough, let's take off, you're free to, <laughs> but it's this, with Jesus, the best is always yet to come. Amen. With Jesus, the best is always, always yet to come. So I wonder what it would be like in my life and in your life if we lived like that were truth best is always yet to come. John's gospel, the second chapter, it, it, it's a simple story. It's not a parable. It's a narrative. It's a narrative that involves Jesus and it, 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 it captures the essence of, of what Jesus did so very frequently, but it's a narrative passage. And John's reflecting on what he witnessed as he's writing this, this spirit-inspired gospel account, good news account. And it starts like this, on the third day, which by the way, when Jesus is involved, third days are great days. Amen. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. Now, Cana is a, it's an obscure place. It's a, it's a very, very small little town that uh, lies about nine miles north of Nazareth. And it wasn't until the 1800s through excavations did they even come to the, the, the uh, knowledge of being able to pin down where Cana was, like where it geographically uh, existed. But it, it's nine miles or so north of Nazareth. It's a very obscure little place. And uh, another thing, not only is, is it really cool when third days happen, when Jesus is involved, Jesus takes obscure places and people and makes them famous. Amen. So he's at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, a very small, no-name place. His mom's there, and, and he and his disciples are there. And they're at a wedding. And, and you know, weddings are, are really uh, quite different in a Jewish culture than they are in, in most of our context. Um, I, I go to quite a few weddings. I spend time at weddings. Weddings are beautiful things. And, and they're, they're uh, specifically designed moments where words and meaning will be exchanged that will impact lifetimes and genealogies, right? They're really specific things that, that people craft with purpose, and a great deal of time goes into them. You know, for most young ladies, they start planning their wedding after they attend their first wedding. So I encourage you not to take your children until they're teenagers. <laughs> most guys start thinking of weddings when they think, she, get, she can cook. She irons. <laughs> Sorry, bad joke. Thank you for laughing, Corey. <laughs> so they're at this wedding, and weddings there lasted about a week. And here's what would happen. At the birth 
Within the first year of a young girl's life, the father would take common table wine. Wine was used in everyday, ordinary circumstances in that time period in history. They didn't have access to clean water like we have access to clean water. They would go to a well or they would go to a river, but when the, when the harvest came, they would trample grapes and they would make wine, right? It would start out as juice and it would go through a fermentation process and they would drink it early. And a lot of times I'm told it tastes kind of like vinegar, but it had a medicinal purpose and a, and a common purpose. And the common purpose was it's what they drank. But the father would take common table wine, and on the birthday of the, of the girl, they would set aside a portion of that wine. They would fill a jar, and they would seal it, and they would put it off, and they would keep it until the day of her wedding. And they did it at year one all the way to year 13 or 14 or whenever her day of marriage came. And they married quite a bit earlier back then. So they're at the wedding, and it was also, and I think this should be reinstated, dads were a big deal at a wedding, right? The, 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 the young man who wanted to marry the girl would come and ask the father, which I think we ought to do, permission, and somebody should ask me one day, to marry their daughter. And they would also negotiate a price. Now, the daughter wasn't really for sale. It's not like that. But there was an exchange. They understood, this, is, this, this daughter of mine is of value to our family, and we love her very much. So if you, don't, if you haven't prepared in advance, how could we trust you to take care of her for life, right? So they would come, and they would, they would have an exchange of, of uh, monetary valued goods or livestock or something for the hand of the girl. And then the wedding celebration would last for a week. The dad would take his daughter and they would lock arms, and they would begin walking, and the wedding party would be with them, and they would walk to the, to the front door of the groom's house, and they would knock on the door, and the groom would step out. He would receive the, the betrothed bride-to-be, and they would craft the covenant there on his porch. And it would happen on Wednesday if the girl was a virgin, Thursday if she was a widow. Is that too much information? Do you guys like history? Okay, good. After that, they would begin walking around with lit torches, and it would happen in the evening, right? The, the wedding happened in the evening. They would have lit torches, and, and they, would, they would follow them all through town, and there would be a canopy stretched out over the bride and groom, and they would walk all through town slowly, and people would come out and congratulate them on the, on the, the, the walk. And then they would begin to have a feast, and the feast would last for days. And that's where we break into the narrative. We break into the narrative where the feast is, has begun. And in verse 3, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. I don't know why she said it. Have you ever wondered, was she thirsty? You all should read the Bible with a little imagination. <laughs> Dear woman, Jesus replied, why do you involve me? Now, when, you, when we read that for, for the first time and we read, dear woman, and we think, man, Jesus is being kind of disrespectful, but that's not true at all. He was, he was addressing his mother in a very appropriate way. Jesus would never be disrespectful to his mother, and he was addressing her appropriately. Why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. You know what I've learned about moms over the years? Moms often know more about their children than their children know about themselves at certain times in their life. And we may be thinking, how could Mary know something about Jesus that Jesus didn't know because Jesus is God, but Jesus is also human, right? He took he, he took on humanity's flesh. He took on humanity as a person, right? So he could understand who we are. He could understand what we went through. And so that he could become the last official necessary sacrifice for our atonement to be made right with God. That's why the cross was a part of his future at this point. 
He says, my time has not yet come. But his mom says uh, to the servants in the next verse, do whatever he tells you. My time has not yet come. Hey, guys, listen to me. Focus over here. Whatever he tells you, do that. And then, uh, and then I see her walking away, right? I don't think she stood around and watched Jesus. I don't think she mean mugged him or glared at him. I think she just left and went back to the party. Whatever it was that she was doing. But she left a very important statement to the servants. Do whatever he tells you. Amen. Do whatever he tells you. I wonder what it would be like If we lived in such a way that we wanted, to, we wanted to do whatever God told us, I wonder if our lives would be different than they are now. That whatever he told us, we, 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 we would simply do it. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Now, the Jewish people were very religious people, and they were very ceremonious. And and before they would eat, they would go, and they would cup their hands, and they would have water poured over it. They wouldn't wouldn't cup them to make a bowl. They They would have kind of a hole, and water would pour over their hands, making them ceremonially clean. There was no antibacterial anything in the water, right? It was just water. So it was a ceremony more than a sanitation. And Jesus took a lot of hits when you read the gospel accounts, when you read in the New Testament. People were really upset with him because he didn't do all the ceremonial stuff uh, all the time. So there are six of those jars, which would hold uh, probably, if we, if we say they were six gallons each, which normally they were, would hold 120 gallons of water. Jesus said to the servants in verse 7, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. Go and, go and fill the, the jars with water. And they do it. And then he said, now draw some out, ladle some out, and take it over to the master of the banquet. The master of the banquet would be like the head um, person overseeing the catering of the meal, right? It wasn't the, the, the groom's dad or the bride's dad. It's somebody that they would, have, they would have hired or would be a family friend that was known to be somebody that could efficiently serve meals to quantities of people. And they would say, and he said to them, take that over to the master of the banquet. So he's take, these servants are going over with a ladle of, of water they just drew into common ordinary jars from the well or from the river, wherever they were. And they go over to the master of the banquet and they're handing it to him. And it's interesting, when we get to the end of verse 8, it says they did so. You know, to do what he says and to fill the jars, I wonder if I would have been one of the guys that would have said, I'll help you fill the jars, but I don't want to take it over. I wonder if I would have wanted to settle for partial obedience to the command. I wonder if I would have wanted to go halfway and, and yet expect full reward, right? I'm just wondering that about me. I, I don't know if that's something you want to wonder, uh, but, but I just wonder, would we, would we do it? Because see, they, they understood. It tells us this, um, they did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. See, they, they knew that this was water, and the wine had run out. And see, in that time when people would get to the end of, of their wine supply, or when people had had enough wine, like that their taste buds are just kind of like, yeah, whatever, they would begin to, to water it down. And so for any servant in that culture to take water to the master of ceremonies, it's making a statement like, hey, we're out of wine, and that is a disgraceful thing. And Mary knew, and this is why Mary was concerned, she knew it would be forever pinned on the couple to live with the disgrace of not having been prepared. 
for the feast. I wonder what was going through the servants' minds. I wonder what was in their thought process. Because see, this is the first miracle of Jesus. They don't have in their history to think about him turning fish and bread into a buffet bar. They don't have in their history to think about that time Peter jumped out of the boat and took some steps. They don't have in their history to think about the time that he stood in the boat and he, and he spread out his arms and he said to the wind and the waves, be still. And they, and they were stilled. They didn't have that in their history. They were living in real time the event of the very first miracle that was taking place, right? This is an incredible story and it's so simple, but yet it's so profound. And I think the simple things are the profound things in life. Do whatever he tells you to do. So they did it, it says. He did not realize where it came from, though the disciples, or I'm sorry, the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone. Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you've saved the best till now. Everyone brings out the best wine in the beginning, and then they, they kind of bring out the cheaper wine toward the end. But this, this master of ceremonies, who's probably officiated lots and lots of weddings, right? He's been the chief caterer of lots of shindigs. He's going, man, everybody does it different than you just did it. Amen. You know what I've learned? God does it different than most everyone does it. Everyone does it differently, but you brought out the best first. Everyone normally brings out what they set aside in the first year of birth, and they bring it out and they serve it because it's aged. And I don't know a whole lot about wine, but I guess the longer it sits around, the better it is if it's in the right conditions. And, and it's aged, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's really good, and it's had the process of time to mature and the fermentation and all those things. They bring that out first, but man, I don't know how you did it, but you brought out the best last. I love that. Amen. Verse 11, this is the first miraculous sign Jesus performed. And he did it at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. And his disciples, see, he had already called some disciples like five days earlier than this. He had called them to come and follow him, and they were curious about him. Some of the disciples were John's disciples, a few of them, and some of them were brand new. But they were all wanting something more and something different. A disciple is one who comes after, follows after. They wanted something more. They wanted something different. They're following him. And this is the first miracle they see, and they get to be involved in it. Man, have you ever been involved in one of God's miracles? Yeah. Isn't it a beautiful thing when God allows you to be involved and you, you, you allow yourself to walk into the narrative that God has crafted? It's a beautiful thing. Right. And they get to be involved, and they, 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 they put themselves into obedience by going and filling the jars and they bring them over and they take the risk and they draw out the ladle and they walk it over the master of the banquet and, and he takes a sip and they're watching. Can you imagine how they were watching that guy drink from that ladle? I mean, get him. Uh, can you picture it in your mind? Suspicion, hope. And then they see the delight on his face and they hear what he says to the bridegroom. And then they place their faith in Jesus. Amen. You know, 120 gallons, I'm not a mathematician, but I did the math. 120 gallons of wine would serve 2,000 four-ounce glasses. I don't know how much wine you put in a glass. I assume it's not a tumbler. So <laughs> there'd be plenty to go around is the point of the best. Jesus talked a lot about wine. We're going to take from the Lord's table and, and celebrate communion this morning. With the, with 
the body of believers, but it's interesting to me how Jesus used everyday things to make extraordinary and eternal points. In, in Matthew's gospel in the ninth chapter, some disciples of John had come to Jesus and they're saying, listen, the Pharisees and even us, we're, we're fasting. Why aren't you and your, your disciples fasting? And it would have been a voluntary fast day, most likely, in the Jewish culture. They had mandatory days and voluntary days. And Jesus said to him, you know, you, you, don't, you don't fast. Why fast when the bridegroom's with you, right? You don't, you don't mourn when he's here, so you, you wait until he's not here. And, and he's trying to help them understand, look, there's no need to fast. I'm, I'm right here. The I am of the Bible is now present in, in this moment. And then he said, it's kind of like this. It's like taking an a unshrunk piece of cloth and fastening it, sewing it to a already shrunk piece of cloth. When you do that, what's going to happen is it will tear away from each other because the cloth doesn't match what it's meant for. And then, I mean, right, Jesus answers our question with three stories. I love good stories, and he told them in an awesome way. And then he said, it's kind of like this. You can't put new wine in old skins. Or you'll lose both the wine and the skins. Jesus is teaching a spiritual point, and I wanna, I'm going to wrap this up so we can take communion together. He's making the spiritual point that you can't do a new thing in an old way and expect a different result. That's right. in, in that day and in that time, they would take goat skin and they would fashion it to hold wine and it would expand when, the, when both the wine and the skin were new. The goat skin would expand, but it would harden over time. And Jesus is making this point. You, you can't take new wine and put it in old skins or you'll lose them both. And you, 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 because the fermentation process is a violent process. The fermentation process is a, is a changing process. And Jesus is helping them understand something new is happening and you can't, you can't do something new in the old way and expect a better result. You know, as a pastor, it's a very frustrating thing when, when I hear people tell me the difficulties in their life and that they want God to do something new, but they continue to want to live in the same old way, and then they want to blame God for not doing a new thing. And I know that's hard to hear, but it is just truth. And it doesn't take a pastor to tell you that. Any counselor can tell you the same. Any, any counselor will tell you, for for. For change to happen in your life, you need to be willing to embrace the change that you so desire. And Jesus is saying, listen, you can't put new wine in old skins. And, and, and let me just tell you, you can't ask the Holy Spirit to do something new in you and continue to live out the old format. And, and I don't know where you're at. I don't know if you're feeling empty. I don't know if you feel like you've run out of the new wine. But I'm telling you that Jesus is saying, the Spirit is saying, He wants to do something new in you. My question is, do you want to be new in it? Amen. Right? You can't be the old thing with a new thing and expect a good thing. Amen. And with Jesus, the best is always yet to come. In the closing chapters of my mom's life, you know, when people are are rounding third and headed to home, and they know it, and they've been told by doctors and, and science and all those things, you begin to have conversations that are different than the ones you had before. And it's, it's a good thing. You know, my mom made statements like, I didn't get to pick the tune, but I do get to choose how I dance. That's good theology. Because he picks the tune. We choose how we dance. But we had this saying, and it was a saying that I would either make to her or she would make to me when I felt like she was feeling down or I felt like maybe she was feeling scared 
or any of those things. And I would just say, Mom, you know, the best is yet to come. And she would, she would often say to me after she would hear from the doctors or she was in pain again or she, they, they changed her medication because the pain wasn't being managed by what they were doing just days before and she would say something like this, the best is yet to come. Because with Jesus, the best is always yet to come. Amen? Amen. And, and I love this. So if I could give you a couple takeaways before we go to communion, it's this. In order to do what he says, you have to be willing to hear what he's saying. Amen. How many of us hear from God? And that's rhetorical. I just wonder, how many of us hear from God? I had somebody tell me one time, Melissa and I were in Indiana, and I was interviewing for a job there as a youth pastor. At the time, we were living in Ironton, and not long before that interview, um, I had a very unusual circumstance take place. Uh, one of the boys that was a part of our youth ministry that came from a very troubled home quit showing up to youth group, and, uh, and that was a sign of trouble for me, and I called to his house, and the number just rang busy like it had been disconnected, you know, back when telephones were hooked to walls, and they had really long extension cord to the handset. So I got in my car and I drove down to his house and I told a friend of mine that I was going to go and, and just asked him to pray for me because I know his father, this boy's father, uh, whose name was Gary, was a very mean and violent man in his past and that he didn't like Christians and all that jazz. And, and my buddy Jay, who shot me a text already this morning, he said, good luck, man. <laughs> I don't know what kind of prayer support good luck is. But it's what I had, and it's what I went on. I don't really believe in luck, but well, there I went. I got the other, to the other end of our small town there in Ironton, and I, I went up to the, the front porch, and I knocked on the door, and, and sure enough, Gary Sr. opened the door, and he had a full beard, and, and he said, what do you want? And I said, well, I'm looking for your son. He said, well, you're not going to find him here. And I said, well, where is he? And he said, um, well, they left. And I said, well, how long are they going to be gone? I don't know. And he was getting irritated. And I said, listen, I love your son. I know that uh, you don't really like church, but church likes you. And I'm just here to let you know that we care about him. And then he invites me in, and he's got a shotgun right by the door, which people who just got out of jail should not have shotguns by their door. And he said, sit down. So I complied. <laughs> And after about an hour and a half of him telling me all the things, it, it turned out he had, he had shoved mom, she had fallen down, called the police, and then while they took him to a three-day stay over at the Gray Bar Hotel, she packed up and they moved out. But I felt in my spirit, I heard the Lord saying to me, Gary's going to come to know me. And I thought, man, what are you talking about? Gary's going to come to know me. Okay, Lord. So I called my buddy who, who you know, was my prayer support. And I said, uh, man, this is what I'm hearing from God. I'm hearing that God, God's saying that Gary's going to come to know Jesus and, and that he's going to use our church and use our, our family to do it. And he said, well, that's either God or you're deranged. But either way, good luck. <laughs> The long story short, Gary did come to know Jesus. He and his wife got back together. They have a Habitat for Humanity house. He stayed with us for a while after he got evicted from his house. But you know, oftentimes, bad things get worse before God gets invited and then things get better. Amen. And that was Gary's testimony. And it's always a pleasure to run into Gary from time to time when we're in that part of the, of the state. But I told that to a pastor that I was having this interview at in Indianapolis. I said, I feel like, you know, I just, I heard God saying, and he said, well, what do you mean you heard God saying? I said, I just felt it in my spirit. And he said, I would, and this was a big church. He said, well, I encourage you not to tell people that. And I said, well, why not? He said, they're going to think you're weird. And I said, well, aren't we supposed to be weird? 
Because if, if normal's not hearing from God, then I just never want to be normal. If normal means I don't hear from the Lord, I don't ever want to be normal. The servants heard, and then they did. And then the miracle resulted. You know, there's a linkage here to a result. I want to hear so that I can, can, can do so that there can be a result. But the result has something to do with the hearing and the doing. And if I keep hearing but I don't do, pretty soon I stop listening or hearing altogether. So here's my question to you as we prepare for, the, for communion. Are you hearing from God in your life? And there are ways that we hear from God. And I would say to you, we hear from Him through His Word, and we hear from Him through His Spirit. And His Spirit will never be contradictory to His Word. What are we hearing? I think one of the greatest problems in our culture is our churches are filled with people that do religious things but don't hear from the Lord. I know it's uncomfortable, but that's, that's good preaching. And if we're hearing, then are we doing what the Lord says? Or are we following the voice of the Spirit? One has to do with listening. The other has to do with obedience. You know, Samuel told King Saul... Clearly, to obey is better than sacrifice, right? The greatest sacrifice of your life is your obedience to God. It's the best sacrifice. Paul said, therefore, as I told you last week, right? Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies, offer your lives, be the living sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed, to do what he says in obedience is better than the fat of rams, Are we hearing, are we doing, and are we seeing the results? Because with Jesus, the best is always yet to come. The best is always yet to come. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your love, and I thank you for your truth thank you for your goodness and I thank you for your spirit that is alive and well and moving and Lord I pray that you would draw near to us in these moments and that you would grant to us the ability to hear the courage and bravery to obey and the willingness the willingness to offer our lives to you in surrender Father we love you today and we thank you and we need you and I ask that you would use this time with your closeness and